The following podcast was recorded on Friday, July 15th, 2022, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Welcome, Sam. Good morning. Today, Sam explains why it will take time for the decline in food costs to filter through. We had the CPI print this week, Sam, 9.1%. We've had a slight reprieve in gas prices, but what about the surging food costs? I wanted to just take a moment to touch on some data as grocery prices continue to rise, fastest pace since 1979. Margarine's up 34%, eggs are up 33%, flour 19%, chicken 18.6%, the list goes on. But tell us what's really driving all the food costs? Is it the Ukraine war? What what's really happening? Well, it's really interesting because I think I, I think the food the food prices you know they don't get enough attention to be honest. Uh, a lot of attention goes to gasoline, right? You, you know, the kind of our thing is that they're you know for the consumer, gasoline and groceries are the two things that really matter. They're the two things that show up when you talk to people about inflation, and they're the two things that the Fed broadly ignores. Uh, using core inflation, so I think there's there's an interesting uh, thing here, and you're right. You know, gasoline prices have fallen, you know, about 20% from a month ago. So you know, it's not insignificant whatsoever. That gets a lot of attention. Food prices, meanwhile, have not generally fallen at all. If anything, they've continued to creep a little higher at the grocery store, and that's a, it's a it's a longer story than simply Ukraine. Right? You know, you get the uh, notion that the war in Ukraine is the reason behind all of the rising food costs. In reality, food costs and foodstuffs had been rising for quite some time prior to the invasion and prior to COVID. Uh, it's a simple supply and demand issue. Uh, you know, there's been some bad weather for the past few years. That's been problematic for corn, soybean, uh, and soybeans in particular, and that's led to higher food costs. And it probably is one of the, call it under, under, reported stories out there that it really wasn't the war that caused food prices to be high. Food prices were already going to be high. Uh, it just accentuated it. And if we do focus on Ukraine, they have large exposure to wheat. Uh, was wheat elevated before the invasion began? It was, yeah. It, it, you look at the yellow line on the chart here, um, you know, you've, you've seen it go from somewhere around 500 in late 2018 uh, to you know, call it 700, 800 uh, in the pre-war uh, period. It did surge to 1400 uh, after the invasion, uh, but it's round tripped, right? It's gone all the way, it went up to 1400 from call it 800, uh, and then it round tripped back to uh, 800 now. Uh, that's still a very high price. I mean, that's, that's not something to kind of celebrate. Uh, that's going to continue to be an issue as we, call it, get through the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, if, you know, if that's going to happen, I would suggest that it's probably a longer term geopolitical issue uh, that trying to replace or secondarily source the wheat that was going to be exported from Ukraine is going to be incredibly difficult uh, as in the next few years. And how about fertilizer? You've got a nice chart on fertilizer costs. They're well off their peak, but they're 100% above historical levels. Yeah, if you can find it, uh, there's a there's there's kind of a two sided story to the fertilizer market. Uh, fertilizer costs have skyrocketed, um, and it's difficult to find fertilizer, uh, even if you want to pay the prices that are being charged. Uh, you've seen a number of stories about people pivoting to uh, either human waste or chicken waste uh, as a supplement to uh, their fertilizer uh, to be able to. Uh, Keep the soil healthy. Uh, that's going. This is going to be a story that's much longer term in nature. And again, going back to 
uh, the chart that we were just on, this is one of the reasons that you're unlikely to see a significant break in the prices for wheat, corn, and soybeans anytime soon. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to increase your production when you have your input costs, which are basically fertilizer and diesel and fuel being extraordinarily high. And that makes it difficult to either plant more acres right because those additional acres are far more expensive and the incremental costs are very very high uh, and it also makes it difficult to even plant what you already wanted to plant uh, so it's it's a two-sided issue here that i again i don't think it's getting enough attention and it's not uh short-term in nature either right it's not a supply and demand imbalance on diesel fuel because of cracking spreads or because of you know shut, uh, maintenance shutdowns. This is something that's much much deeper and will take a significant amount of time to to really work its way through the system. And food prices are likely to continue to be elevated. And Sam, can you walk us through wheat production and wheat yields? Yeah, this is this is a great chart, um, mostly because it has nothing to do. Uh, with you know how much people actually produce, uh, right? Um, you know the, the interesting one here uh, in my mind is uh, Saudi Arabia uh, being so productive at wheat, and they don't grow much wheat at all. Uh, but they're highly, highly productive in the wheat acres that they do actually grow. So this is this is one of those charts that I think is both incredibly useful, but also kind of a little a little trippy, uh, right? Russia, U.S huge producers, Ukraine, huge producers of wheat, significant. Uh, China is actually also a very large producer of wheat, uh, quietly. Uh, but, you know, we're actually not that productive. I mean, Mexico is more productive than the U.S. Argentina, far more productive than the U.S. And a lot of Western Europe is far more productive than the U.S. when it comes to how much we get per hectare acre planted. That's a longer term opportunity for benefits here. I do think that you're going to see productivity gains over time because you're going to have to have productivity gains over time and you're going to have to figure out uh, better ways to manage those acres. Uh, and, you know, it's that's, again, not a short term problem. That's a much longer term problem. And I think in kind of filtering back through to one of the reasons why it's unlikely that we're going to see a break at the grocery store anytime soon, you go to Pepsi's. Uh, you know, Pepsi owned Frito-Lay. If you go to their earnings report that came out this week, volumes were basically flat on an organic basis, right? They were all, volumes for Frito-Lay were up like 1%, give or take. Pricing for Pepsi was up 13, 12 to 13% on an organic basis. That is a huge deal, right? That is a lot of pricing power that's being pushed through, not a lot of volume gains. And that's the type of dynamic that I think we're going to continue to see as we go through the rising input costs from corn, soybeans, wheat, et cetera, potatoes. As those production costs continue to increase, you're going to continue to see those increases get pushed through to the grocery store. And so far, you haven't seen the type of pushback that you would anticipate with those types of price increases. Sam, what should we be watching for next? When it comes to when it comes to, uh, to the food front, I think it'll be really interesting to see how the commodities react to any call it positive news on the peace front. Uh, I, I do think that as we begin to go into the back half of the year for, um, you know, for 2022, you're going to begin to have a significant amount of push for peace. Uh, you know, not only do Ukraine and Russia likely want this war to be over, but you're also going to have a significant amount of push from countries that rely on the global food supply chain and are having significant problems those are going to be those countries are going to begin to push back against uh, you know the aggression i think in mass there also there's also the problem of energy in europe that's going to continue to be a significant issue and it's going to continue to push those countries to either figure out a way to keep the heat on this winter or really push both sides. So it'll be interesting to see how headlines begin to bump up against the realities on the ground and what that does to the incremental uh, cost of fertilizer, number one, because Russia and uh, Ukraine are both large producers of fertilizer too. Uh, but also, you know, and that, that'll be a significant, that could be a significant uh, tailwind to plantings next spring. And that could be uh, basically where we see the first real break on the food front. 
uh, or it could go the other way and you could see this become a much, much more acute problem uh, across the developing world. Sam, thank you for your thoughts today and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions, please contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks again and have a great week.